Today's guests are Peter Fikowski, who is an MIT graduate in physics and chairman of the Foundation for Climate Restoration, and Dr. Peter Wadhams, who is an emeritus professor of ocean physics from Cambridge University and currently a professor at Turin Polytechnic in Italy. This man went under the ice pack in nuclear submarines for 40 years, studying the, the Arctic ice cap from underneath, unique perspective, not from satellites. And, and for that, to me, he should get the Nobel uh, Prize in Physics. This is the book that he wrote, it was published in, in 2016 in hardcover, and it's now available in paperback. It's been translated into eight languages so far. Today's program will be on climate restoration. We won't have a slide set as we're used to doing. This will be an interactive question and answer session with our two panelists and, and two co-hosts. Regina, would you start off? Yeah, sure, absolutely. Thank you, Stuart. Um, so my question is, what is climate restoration, and how is it different from what everyone else is working on here at COP? Climate restoration is a concept of uh, the goal of giving our children the same climate, the same safe climate we had when I was young, where we know that humanity can survive. And in a sense, it's the same. That is, it's taking from the implicit. Everyone wants, of course, to have a safe climate where humans can survive and taking it to the explicit. And to be explicit, you have to specify what and, and by when. So getting CO2 below the level that, to the levels that humans have survived long term in the past, which is 300 parts per million, and doing that by the year 2050, which gives us time that we're very confident that our species and civilization can survive. Well, the other part of that question is, how is it different than what's being negotiated, supposedly, back in the plenaries? The plenaries have been focusing basically on getting to net zero emission. And that was a very good goal back in the 1970s, when CO2 levels were, were still at safe levels, that humans could survive. And as CO2 emissions have gone up, of course, it became clear we have to get the carbon out, but the, the policy didn't change, the goal didn't change. And so although we need to get the carbon out to uh, assure future generations that we can survive, um, the speaking of it has been trying to just reduce emissions. So it's raising the bar to the point where we're co explicitly committed to the survival and flourishing of humanity. Uh, and the jargon for reducing emissions is mitigation. We want to mitigate, yeah? Right, right. Okay. So, so we're, we're uh, uh, climate restoration is the third leg of the stool. So you have mitigation to reduce emissions, and adaptation to deal with what there is, and restoration is get the carbon back out so that the, clim so that the world's climate supports humanity and the nature that we require. So have we been lying to ourselves all this time that emissions reductions aren't enough, that mitigation is not enough? Um, no, I don't, I don't think we've like been lying to ourselves. Um, it's just that the question of taking carbon out of the atmosphere, reducing CO2 levels, just simply hasn't arisen because it hasn't seemed to be technically feasible. But in fact, it is perfectly technically feasible. Um, so long as we didn't know that wasn't thought wasn't in our minds, then it was purely a question of reducing emissions. And but we, we've now learned that, of course, because carbon stays in the atmosphere for so long, um, we now estimate 30,000 years, it's essentially everything we've put into the atmosphere stays there. So therefore, any carbon emissions at all are going to give us a warmer climate. Our climate will constantly warm. If we reduce our emissions, all that happens is the climate warms more slowly. We just roast more slowly, but in the end, we'll have a much warmer climate with really severe 
uh, catastrophic results. So the only answer is to take CO2 out of the atmosphere, to take it out of the environment. And uh, we can do that, and we've, the ways have been developed to make it possible. They just have to be made more, uh, uh, more cost-effective. But the, the reason why the question of lying arises is because people always thought, didn't, first of all, didn't know that you could get carbon dioxide levels down. We thought we, it was just a matter of, of trying to reduce emissions. But even reducing the emissions was something people didn't want to accept as a necessity because it meant changing our ways of life and it would be easier to try and keep on with our present ways of life and pretend nothing's happening. That's human nature. But we, we could get away with it when there were, didn't seem to be any alternative. But now we have an alternative. Yes, for, for me, um, it, it sort of occurred as a lie as I've gotten older. I've only gotten explicitly involved in climate over the last six years. When I was an undergraduate at MIT, we were discussing climate war global warming a little bit in the 1970s. And it was very clear to me that because CO2 stays in the atmosphere for thousands of years, in order for humanity to survive, we would have to get the carbon out. It was very simple. And I didn't think that it required, required an MIT graduate to announce that discovery. As, as obvious as uh, plate tectonics is to us now, but back 50 years we were taught, oh no, Africa and South America never fit together. Never, never they were never. Now we well, know they were. Well, it, it, there, there's a, a dichotomy, there, there's a split, because as a scientist, we didn't know how to get the carbon out, as Peter Wadham said. Um, as an engineer, uh, we do know how to get carbon out. You just scale it up and learn how to do it more efficiently. And because climate was being discussed by scientists, it was approached as if it was impossible. But then uh, as I moved to Silicon Valley and became an, more of an engineer, it was very clear, yeah, we could do it if we wanted to, but we would have to change the whole culture to do that. And it turns out that you have to change the UN. That's why we're here at the UN talking about climate restoration, because it's the UN that, that, said, that has been saying we need to get to zero emissions. And no one wants to say that's a lie. And you know, with deep respect, I worked on the getting well, it's to It's not zero. a lie. We have to get to zero emissions. It's not the complete truth. That's right. Mm -hmm. that, exactly. Thank you. And, you know, and I promoted zero, getting to zero emissions for many years before I realized we just have to admit that we were misdirected and heading into extinction, as Extinction Rebellion tells us we are, and Greta Thunberg tells us we are, and, and make a turn so that we're going to the direction we want, which is the survival and flourishing of our species. That brings up an important point. I love the idea of drawing carbon out of the air. It would be really nice if, you know, people have air purifiers in their homes to call, you know, bring down out the pure, uh, impurities in the air and the pollutants. Um, would it work something like that? And then not to throw a curveball, but since 2007, I've read that um, methane emissions have just exploded. And would the drawing the carbon out of the air, would it work the same way with methane? Or is that a whole other situation altogether? Uh, well, with methane, it's a different situation because the methane uh, is, in the short term, is an extremely serious threat. Um, the, at the moment, we're facing a threat of emission of methane from the under, underwater in the Arctic Ocean. That's, that's a big threat. But if it happens as a one-off, it would cause a, a disaster in terms of warming of the planet. But the methane does go away. After about 10 years, it oxidizes, and uh, we, uh, the, threat, the threat goes, although it's very, very bad when it happens. So methane, we do, in a sense, we don't need to take out of the atmosphere. It takes itself out, but it's the carbon dioxide that stays around forever if we don't get rid of it. Just so that I can understand it, it is so what you're talking about in terms of pulling the carbon dioxide out of the air, it would be akin to, to a, from a layman's perspective, um, an air purifier. It's better to look at it the way our planet has done it in the past, the way nature has done it. Um, there were times when the CO2 in our atmosphere is ten time, was 10 times higher than it is now. 
And so nature knows how to get carbon out of the air. And where nature puts the carbon is mostly in limestone. Over 99% of our carbon on our planet is in limestone now, which was taken out of the air. And a lot of the carbon is also in oil and, and coal, which is, the, of course, the carbon that we're burning back into the atmosphere and we need to get out. And so we have methods that have been demonstrated that can produce limestone. Nature does it very easily. If you think of a clam making a clamshell, it's a very simple process. And we can use the clamshell is limestone. And by weight, it's almost half CO2. And so we can sell, the, we can make synthetic limestone, make, you know, doing the same chemistry as the clam, and then sell that for the rock that we use for our roads and buildings. Mm. And that's exciting because we have a budget for that already. And so it's just a matter of building that technology. And the company in the Silicon Valley, which is doing that, is opening their first commercial plant next year. I agree on the whole with that, but I think it can only be a partial solution uh, in terms of paying for itself, because we're dealing here with uh, 40 billion tons of carbon dioxide per year that we're putting into the atmosphere, and we've got to try and take them out before we can even start to bring down the existing levels. That makes this the world's biggest industry. This will be not only a gigantic industry, it will be the world's largest industry will be removing carbon dioxide from the air or from the ocean, either way, which we're taking it out of the climate system. So it's, it's massive and it's too much, I think, to expect that it will entirely pay for itself. There will have to be a, an, an increase in global taxes to pay for this, but it pays for itself in other ways because if we can do it efficiently, uh, then the amount of damage that we're doing to the, to the world by, by putting CO2 into the atmosphere uh, is, can, be, can be costed, and it's something like $40 a tonne. But if we take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere more cheaply than that, we're gaining financially, even though, of course, we're having to pay for it through taxes, but we're getting that back because we're not damaging the environment so much. Now, I'd encourage people to view the, when we have it edited and online, to view our program that we did yesterday on ocean pasture restoration, because that was not a, as we say in business, a cost center, it was a profit center. That was a potentially profitable business because it produced so much more than it took in terms of financial resources. Yeah. Let me. Can, can I? Uh, yeah. So I have a, a somewhat different perspective than uh, than Dr. Peter, uh, and that is that uh, we can get the CO2 out profitably. Now, obviously, it would be nice if we could get government funding, but in today's political environment, we can't predict it, and I don't want my children and your children to be dependent on hoping that we can get government funding. And as the, yesterday's program demonstrated, we actually, there's very strong evidence, there's, it's been demonstrated that we can get, in that case, 80, billion, 80 million tons of CO2 out of the air for about two and a half million dollars. And so, uh, it, given that technology gets better over time, it's, uh, I'm optimistic that we could do it, uh, that we get the all, all trillion tons of CO2 of excess CO2 out by the year 2050 and, and do it commercially. So as the government works on, on uh, governance and regulation and safety, the commerce can work on providing the food that the ocean restoration provides and the rock that our construction and industry needs. Uh, why haven't I, I not heard climate restoration about it as a, as a thing? Well, well I, I agree with that as a, as a problem. Um, because uh, I lecture on climate uh, change and climate restoration. Uh, my students, of course, know all about it because I teach it to them. But when I give lectures to students, young people, um, I was giving one at the uh, Turin Academy of Sciences two days ago, they, ask, they come up and ask, why don't I know anything about this? I've never heard anything about this. So somehow, that young people who are full of enthusiasm and idealism for doing something about the climate don't generally know that climate restoration through um, 
uh, carbon dioxide absorption out of the atmosphere. They don't know that's possible. They've never heard anything about it. So there's a publicity case. There's a case for making, for telling this story and telling it as in as many places as we can at a high level and, and directly so that people are aware there is this alternative. And in fact, it's not just the alternative, it's what we should be doing in preference to, to other methods or as well as other methods, because otherwise our climate will simply get, continue to get warmer, which is going to lead to disaster faster or slower. Whereas if we can get the CO2 level down, even if we don't get it down to 300, we are improving things. We are, we are saving the climate and saving ourselves. I'd like, to, uh, I'd like to follow up on your question there, Stuart. Not only why haven't we heard of it, which is an important point, but also why isn't restoration being done? And, and I also want to say that, you know, that your students haven't heard of it. We know the problem, but to not know that there are various solutions is so dispiriting um, and can lead to, to apathy or not doing anything. So, so that's my question. So why isn't it being done? What I found, so, so I and my organization uh, originated the term climate restoration, maybe not the first time ever, but we publicized it. And what I discovered is it's a lot like the story about the emperor's new clothes, that it, it's pretty obvious, as I said, as a 20-year-old, as a 19-year-old, it was clear to me that needed to be done, but no one talked about it. And so I always assumed that the great professors had some reason they were not talking about it. And being a mere 19-year-old or 20-year-old, I didn't want to embarrass myself by promoting getting carbon out of the air. And I'm 64 now. I feel like I'm entitled to say, no, we actually do need to get the, the CO2 out of the air. And it is embarrassing. And it's, it, when I talk to leadership at the UN, they love the concept. But it's very difficult. They can, it's difficult for them to speak about it publicly yet for the same thing, same idea as the emperor's new clothes, that it needs to be come up from the ground, it needs to be the youth, it needs to be the, the youth leaders, religious leaders who talk about it, because they can say it without the peer-reviewed research. The UN can't say it until there's the peer-reviewed research, and the peer-reviewed research can't happen until someone uh, authoritative says it. It can't be the UN because they don't have the peer-reviewed research and that leaves the, uh, you know, Thunberg and the religious leaders and political leaders uh, running for president or prime minister who can say it. I'm going to ask a, a, a multi-part question now. Can we really restore the climate? What kind of processes are involved? Are they processes that are mechanical? You've got to build something. Are they natural? If you can give us a list, I love and I think the audience would love to hear the, the, the techniques, maybe a short bit about each one, so we can get our heads around it. And then are these methods that I'm going to hope you'll list for us between the, you two gentlemen, are they safe and are they being applied yet or not? So that's multi-part. See yeah. how much of it you can remember. <laughs> well, uh, I'll start off and then pass on. Um, I think we, we can restore the climate, but it's a very big job to get it back to the state it was in before the Industrial Revolution. Um, we've, we've added so much CO2 to the atmosphere and it's, it's, it's stayed uh, that we've got to take out every year a lot more than we put in and get ourselves down to where we were. That it can be done. It, it all depends on how much effort we put in and also whether we're serious as well about reducing emissions, because if, we've, if we're putting out, say, 40 billion tonnes into the atmosphere a year, then we've got to start off with getting rid of those 40 and then try to get rid of more. But if we only put out 20, we've, and we, 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 we reduce our emissions by a half, we don't have to take out so much before we're getting the, the base level down. So we, we gain, the more we take out uh, of by not uh, doing emissions, the less we have to, to, to take out by carbon dioxide removal in order to get it down uh, in, in get it down to some lower level. Um, the methods, I'll just mention the, 
Let, let, let me uh, address the first part of the question too. So uh, I'm a, a bit more optimistic as an engineer. I, I know that if I want to build, get a result, if I want to build a product, I need to specify exactly what that product is going to do, whether it's software or hardware or a building. Uh, if it's a building, where is it going to be? What is the function? And when does it need to be completed? And once you specify exactly what you want, you find the resources. And what's been missing in climate is we never specified what and by when. And by saying that we want to get the CO2 in the air below 300 by the year 2050, we discovered that we do have the methods to do it and that they're actually economically, totally economically viable. Uh, and so uh, we can definitely get with all the data I've seen. And as a physicist, I, I think you can trust my perceptions of it. Of course, I, there are many things I say which turn out to be wrong. But um, we can't get the CO2 out. It will be a long time before we restore the glaciers and the ice pack. And so the world will look different. But there's, in my studies, there's every reason to expect that humanity will survive. And it will be a little bit different. And I'll let Peter go on with the, some of the methods. Or do you have another yes. question? Uh, well, on that same point, um, humanity will survive. Um, that if to be less optimistic, but to, to be somewhat optimistic is to say, well, if we get the, the level of CO2 in the atmosphere going down instead of relentlessly going up faster and faster every year, then we're on the, the right path. We're on the, we, it, it will enormously increase our sense of, of optimism about the future and will inspire people to do even better. The fact that we, we, we turn the corner and the curve is coming down, even if however long it takes to get it down to where it was before the Industrial Revolution or during the last Ice Age, we still, we're on the right road and, and that would, would be enormous for feeling that we're saved, this world is saved so the world can tackle all its other problems and that the sense that we are on, on the positive route instead of a negative route. I like the idea of being on the positive road and, and doing what we can. Um, I want to follow up on what Peter was saying and my question is, can we succeed, and what does success look like? For example, Peter, you had suggested that we um, would be that the re um, that the ice caps would be able to rebuild themselves, and, and I'm also wondering, what does that say to the permafrost? Um, once it's gone, is it always gone? What is success? Well, well uh, the first part of getting CO2 down is, in a sense, mechanical. Uh, you monitor how much CO2 there is, and you do the processes that get it out until it gets to the, the level that we pretty much all agree around 280 is, seems to be optimal for humanity. Now, uh, and as we, Peter Wadham said earlier, the methane goes away on its own. The, restoring the, the ice, uh, there are methods uh, we probably don't have time to discuss today for restoring Arctic ice, which make a lot of sense, especially when we're when we've already, when we're on the way to getting CO2 back to safe levels. And so we can do things to accelerate the cooling of the Arctic, which will rebuild the ice. Now we've only got a couple of minutes left, so I'd like to ask both of you, what should people be doing? What should policy be makers doing? What direction should the negotiations be going in terms of climate restoration? What are your calls to action? Mm. Uh, I I think it has to be act, action at a highest level because the fact that my students say, why didn't anybody tell me about this, it applies also to government, ministers and UN bureaucrats. Right at the highest level, there's a lack of awareness that, that we, can, we, can, we have another way, another route that will actually get us into a better state rather than a worse state more slowly. So to get that message across at the highest level means it will then, that will can go through to funding for better, more research on, on uh, new methods or, or, or making the old methods more efficient uh, with, with research results on, on whether, how that's going to work. That will lead on to, to greater funding from, from government sources. Um, it, it would lead to it being taken on by the IPCC as a very serious alternative, which at the moment they're not doing. They're talking about reduction of emissions with um, 
carbon dioxide removal as uh, just uh, something that you might do a little bit of if you don't quite manage to get your emissions to zero, which is what they're saying in their 1.5 degree report, which is, I think, completely uh, at variance with the facts. So it, if we can get it, the story across at the highest level, it will come down to the, the levels at which you'll see concrete results being applied. So Peter, real, really quickly, we're running out of time now. How would you yeah. call to action? So as the founder of the Foundation for Climate Restoration, the key right now, as I had mentioned, is getting the youth and religious leaders and political leaders to call for the goal that we have the technologies, we have the finance, they, need, they'll, they will naturally improve, but we need to have someone say, the emperor has no clothes. And we need our leadership, especially uh, the youth, to say, it's our job to, to uh, have humanity survive and flourish. And uh, once we have that goal in mind, getting CO2 below 300 by 2050, the rest of it will happen naturally because everyone here, all 10,000 people at the summit, at the climb, at the COP, are, are online for that result. They just need to know where to go. Okay, thank you.